Hello everyone. So here is number five in the um, five areas of jazz study video series. Today we're going to talk about practicing tunes. I mentioned in the first introductory video that the tune is the package for your improv. So you may work on your improv a lot with all these different areas, but if you don't learn tunes, you have no packaging for the improv that you do. That's how I see the tunes as part of the packaging. And it's really more than that, but I like to look at it that way because in terms of trying to convince the students to learn tunes, that's how I see it. Without the tunes, you have no vehicle for sharing your wonderful improv with the world. So let's look today at, because I'm going to assume that you guys know what tunes are. Now, jazz tunes tend to be strophic, and what that means is that we play the head, then there's a series of solos, and then we play the head again. That, that's the general. It's not always like that, but 99% of the time, that's how it is. And what we learn when we're learning a tune is the first thing we have to do is learn the head. And for those of you that don't know how we speak, the head is the, the actual melody of the song. And the first step, I would say, is to actually listen to as many different versions of the song as you can. We learn the tunes better when we know how they sound. And that's true for all music. So I know this goes back to the listening. Uh, you know, all five of these areas are interchanged, interconnected, not interchanged, interconnected. All five of the areas. So, for example, we talked in the language section about transcriptions. So there's a connection there. And, and even doing transcriptions falls over into the tune category, too, because one of the best ways to learn how to improvise on a tune is to learn an improvisation, someone else's solo, on that tune. That's a great way to learn how to play a tune. And now, let me tell you quickly... No, let's not get there yet. Okay, so we're talking about learning the head. I also believe that you should learn along with the head any introductions that traditionally go with that head, and then also traditional endings, tags, that go with that head. Too many students today are learning just the, the head itself and don't know what to do at the beginning and the end of the tune. So that's important too. Now... I believe that when you learn the tune, it should be memorized. Don't skimp out on that. If you're one of those guys or gals who has difficulty with the memorization, I say get over that now. Nobody has a genuine difficulty. It's, it's, how can I put that? I don't mean to be offensive. It's just that, it's just, uncomfortable it's something that because you can't do it yet you like there's anxiety that builds up cortisol starts coursing through your veins and it's an unpleasant experience when you first start learning how to do it you have to get over that now that said the best way to get over it is to have a system of memorization I use the working backwards for memorization. I, I also do it for other stuff as well, but it was originally taught to me as a way to memorize. And for those of you who don't know what working backwards is, it's a old, old technique. Um, I've traced it back, you know, literally looking through all the different sources, mostly online, but... Uh, I traced it back to a teacher named Theodore Leszczytyski. And he called it working crabwise, 
But basically, you start at the end. Now, you don't play it backwards. I have to say that every time I talk about this because there are some people who will try to play the song backwards. That's not going to help you so much. Okay, don't play it backwards. We play forward, but we start at the end. Instead of playing the first two measures and then the second two measures and working our way through that way, we start with the last two measures. Now, here's a, a rule that I teach. When you're practicing something for jazz, don't ever look at the music anyway. If you, if you follow that rule, then memorizing stuff isn't that hard because you're doing it all the time. Okay? So, so using working backwards, you, you would look at the music, and if you have to sing it or something, finger it, go ahead and sing and finger it, right? And then look away and play it. Then look at it again. Now see, all good forms of practice, all good practice techniques include repetition. So we're looking at that last two measures. It could be one measure, but with a jazz tune, I usually do two measures, maybe sometimes four measures, depending on the phrase. So you're looking at the last two measures and look away and play it. Then look again, then look away and play it, then look again and look away and play it. Do that for 10 times, usually, Somewhere around number five, you don't look, need to look at it anymore. You can just play it five times over here without looking at it. As soon as you've done your ten times, look at the next two measures going back. So if it's a 32 bar form, uh, you would have done 31 and 32 the first time. Now we're doing uh, 29 and 30. Look at it, play it. Look at it, play it. Then you combine those two. Now you're going 29 to the end of the tune. All right, and you do that progressively all the way through the whole song. That's by far the best way to memorize music. It's called working backwards. Some people call it, like I said, a couple hundred years ago, they called it working crabwise. I say couple hundred, I don't think it was quite that long ago, but you get the idea, right? ancient history for us. Um, and yes, I know that's a classical thing. If you're afraid of using classical techniques in your jazz, um, I would just say get over that too, okay? The, those techniques work. That's why they lasted 200 years, all right? So don't say, oh, oh that's classical. It's not classical. I've been using it in my jazz as a, a way to practice uh, heads. And other things too. Transcriptions should be practiced that way too. If you've got a written transcription that you want to memorize, you start at the end, not at the beginning. So, yeah, that's, that's the head. Once you've memorized the head, now you want to start working on the changes. So, my way of doing the changes is not... And you would already know that just from the other videos I've done, if you've watched those videos. I do not do that root third thing. So I'm not going to do... I'm not going to do that and then the... I'm not going to do all that. Uh, I, I've done it before. It doesn't help much. Yes, it does teach you the chord progressions on an intellectual level. But in terms of how well it helps you play the changes, not well. So, but I've already voiced my opposition to that way of, of learning jazz and also that way of teaching jazz. So what do you do instead? The first thing I do is what I call um, tendency tones, and no, I did not invent tendency tones. I think you can look at them up online. Other people do this as well. I might do it a little differently from what they do. I usually, so we want to write tendency tone etudes out. And basically what you're going to do is thirds, sevenths, and the sevenths resolve to the thirds. Now that doesn't work in every progression, so you have to make adjustments. But basically what you're doing is you're making sort of a flow study. Trumpet players practice flow studies, and this kind of makes a half note flow study or a quarter note flow study. 
that outlines the most important notes of the progression. But it does it in a way that makes musical sense. So you want to practice that. And I would just, once again, I want to memorize that. And then we make a second flow, uh, uh, Tennessee Tone A2 that has more of the um, other notes in it. Now we're going to add eighth notes. And so instead of, so like for a 2-5-1 in, in C. So that would be the, the flow, the, I keep saying flow study. That would be the tendency tone for that progression. Now I want to add other notes. And that's what I practice for um, the second tendency tone. Is you're basically using those same notes again, but you're adding eighth note filler. So this is video number five. And in the previous video, video number four, we talked about the language, right? I believe that we learn the language that emphasizes different chord progressions. I don't believe in playing, because you know, if you heard that video already, if you saw that video, you already heard me say that we don't play changes by playing changes. Don't think changes. You should be thinking motivically in a way that outlines the changes. So one way to do that is to start writing solos that use motifs from the language that we were talking about in the previous video that emphasize those chord progressions. And it comes out sounding like something halfway between, it sounds like an etude. It's not quite an exercise, it's not quite music. But to me, this is so much better than going This, so a lot of people I think would, would, would criticize what I'm talking about here, especially if I'm saying to do this instead of that other stuff. But the end result, remember, I'm not thinking about this from a what's right and what's wrong perspective. I'm thinking about it from a perspective of what works. Most of what is taught as jazz education today does not work. So when we t change our perspective on how to learn changes and make it more about the language, that's when we start doing stuff that actually manifests real music in our performances. So... It's not uncommon for me to write four or five. If it's, a, if it's a chord progression that I'm not comfortable with, it's not uncommon for me to write four or five different etudes using language. These etudes don't have any filler, okay? No rips, scale passages going up two octaves or whatever, nothing like that. It's all completely motivic. It's all completely within the jazz language. You, and you, I was talking earlier about how all of these things overlap. That's another overlap. The language is used to play the changes. You know, if I'm doing a turnaround, that was a turnaround. I did the same turnaround twice. Kind of, it was a little bit different the second time. But... Those were actually motifs that I played to play those changes. Okay? That wasn't me thinking, oh, this chord, that chord, this chord, that chord. That was me thinking this motif, that motif, this motif, that motif. So I guess basically what I'm saying is learning the changes really comes down to learning the language. But it has to be the language that actually emphasizes those, that ch those changes. So, for example, if we're trying to play in the key of C, if we're trying to play the upper extension, the sharp 9 and the flat 9, okay, I added the sharp 
11 2. But you hear what I did? That was a motif, a, a motivic sequence that outlined in the key of C the upper extensions. I had the sharp 11 and I had the flat 9 and the sharp 9. Let me see if I can do it again down an octave. B, C sharp. C sharp is the, the um, sharp 11. Then the B flat and the A flat. That's the sharp 9 and the flat 9. But I wasn't thinking, oh, let me do those extensions. That's why it came out. I was going to do just the flat 9, sharp 9. But I was playing motivically, and where I ended up included the C sharp. It was the motifs I was playing, not that chord progression. I hope that's making sense. And that's how I think actually when I'm, when I'm playing in public now, is I'm playing those motifs. And it's beautiful to play the motifs instead of the chords because you'll never be wrong. <laughs> that's the beautiful part about motivic playing when it comes to, to playing the changes. You will never be wrong because the motif is what it is. That's why you can look at other people's transcriptions. And you know what? People say, well, so-and-so played the changes. Well, look at the transcription. There's a lot of places where great, great players, Charlie Parker, uh, Dizzy Gillespie, all the greats, there's a lot of places where they didn't play the changes, but what they played was actually better than the changes. And it was this motivic stuff I'm talking about. Okay, so it's almost like a continuation of the other video. We're talking again about the motifs. But I believe that if you're not, if you're just trying to play, like, like the turnarounds are a great example. If you're trying to play that chord and that chord and that chord and that chord, good luck with that. And even if you have the technique to do that, what does it sound like? Think about that. What does it sound like? If you play with motifs, it sounds like jazz. If you don't use motifs, you know, and if it doesn't sound like jazz, what's the point of le learning the changes? What's more important, that it sounds like jazz or that you're playing the changes? And, and you can answer, I already said this, but you can answer that question by looking at the transcriptions. All right? Well, that's what I have for you. Use the language to play the changes. Yes, you still have to learn where those changes are, but you don't have to learn it by outlining the chords. You can actually do uh, learning how to play piano. You can learn the changes that way if that's what you want to do. I don't do that because I don't like my piano. It's out of tune. But, yeah, so, you know, that's why I use the Tennessee tones. And that's why I use the written etudes. Oh, by the way, the written etudes, use your own etudes. Write your own. Don't get someone else to write them. Anyway, that's what I have for you about the changes and learning the tunes. The next video is going to be about improvisation. Because improvisation is, in and of itself, a separate skill, a separate art. All right, so there you go. God bless you. If you have any questions, ask below. And if you want to be receiving notifications about these videos, go ahead and click subscribe. All right, thank you, and we'll see you on the next video.